Florestein, Ambassador Carlson, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Barry Deverell, the managing partner of McCann Fitzgerald. And in association with the Institute of International European Affairs, we are delighted to welcome you all to this afternoon's event. And I think it's a testament to the quality uh, of the speaker that we have a full attendance and some standing room like that. So delighted you've all come along. And as you know, in 2018, two new EU regulations are due to come into force. The first one is the general data protection regulation concerning the protection of data. Most of the room now are very familiar with the words with the, the term GDPR. Um, I was with my elderly mother, I was visiting her at the weekend, and uh, I just threw out GDPR to see what sort of reaction I would get, and she said, oh yeah, I've heard of that one. <laughs> we then started talking about cookies, but we didn't uh, talk about the um, e-privacy regulation, which is the other big part of this. And, uh, that took some concerns the confidentiality of communications, updated rules on cookies, and provisions on marketing, including protections against unsolicited communications. The result will be the harmonization of data protection law across the EU. My understanding is that that second regulation, obviously, Dr. Lorisley will talk about that, uh, may come into force by the end of, of this year. Uh, Dr. Lorisley, who will be delighted to join us today, acted as European Parliament Rapporteur on the new EU regulation <coughs> known. EPR. In our address today, she will discuss the European Parliament's recent adoption of the EPR and the progress that is likely to be made in its implementation over the course of 2018. She will also discuss the implications for privacy, media, commerce, and the completion of the digital single market. Our address will be followed by a series of questions posed by Joyce O'Connor, Chair of the IIEA's Digital Future Working Group, and then we will open the floor for questions. So you will get an opportunity to, to ask questions of our speakers. So we need to finish a little later than 2 p.m. So you can all go back to our, our day jobs on today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Marjorie Dorsey. country already before coming here <laughs> and I feel that there is a lot of uh, similarities between uh, my country Estonia and Ireland because my country also is a small country as small as Ireland three times smaller uh, and uh, country also very eager to go as fast as possible uh, towards this uh, say full implementation of all opportunities digital era is providing and at the same time also, uh, I suppose our country is kind of test, test site for all kind of new operations, new things. You know that we have developed a lot of fee services uh, as private, as uh, public. Uh, we have e-voting, which is more than popular. Uh, last elections, one third of the population used e-voting. Uh, and that means that our people are quite uh, uh, quite, to say, uh, well informed and they trust these new technologies. Uh, but trust in uh, technology means that people also have to be aware of uh, what's going on and then have to be educated and also have to take risks and then react to the risk properly. And lastly, we have a very big alarm, for example. Uh, concerning we have all electronic identities, all of us have. And there was a big alarm uh, that the, the system of the developer uh, had really made some small mistake which could be really loophole. And I have to say that it was announced by government that all people have to change their certificates for the electronic identity, identity card. And that was not panic. But clearly, people were explained what is the reason, how it will work, how to do that uh, by internet or going uh, and so on. And then we could cope with this situation without panic, with all citizens' cooperation, with authorities, and it was managed. So it's saying that we, we need trust and we need knowledge and we need cooperation in order to go on 
in this area, and also cooperation between private and public uh, spheres. Because providers, very often, they are private providers, uh, like this company which really provided us with the technology. And at the same time, they have to then follow all the needs and rules <coughs> which are set by citizens, by the state. And, and really, that is a situation, idea of the whole development due to the single market in the EU. That we need clear rules which are the same for everybody. Rules of privacy, rules of data protection, but also rules of contracting, uh, copyright, and all that. Though that all this vast area could work together, that people will know if they go from Ireland to Spain and from Spain to Estonia, that really their smartphones and computers and all the information they're giving and receiving is really tackled the same, according to the same, say, general, general rules, general grammar, say, yeah. And it would <coughs> create transparency and trust. So that was a general aim of all the same. And, uh, Yes, in the uh, European Parliament I was working uh, also on file of GDPR because when I was elected it already was passed, but we started to prepare a trialogue. So that I, I was in this team preparing GDPR trialogue and also I was in trialogue as a shadow teacher. And the same team was working on e-privacy. That is very important. We had a small discussion before uh, because uh, uh, e-privacy regulation really is continuation of GDPR. It is lex specialis, meaning that there are some provisions which are really they covering the area which in GDPR it just may be mentioned but not tackled with the same, say, depth or, or same detail. And there, e-privacy certainly is taking over, setting really the, the, the clear rules. But at the same time, it is inside the frame created by GDPR. It's not outside the frame. And there is a lot of references to GDPR. And a lot of presumption that GDPR is implemented. <coughs> and I have to say to everybody here also who maybe feel like we have heard it hundreds and hundreds of times at all why we need the privacy. So we think that the GDPR is so nice, we now want GDPR to be implemented and then wait. That when you were working on GDPR, what we heard, why we need GDPR, it's so complicated, we have other rules, we don't know why we need the GDPR, we cannot implement it ever. <coughs> now, it seems that it's not possible, and we have to go further. Uh, now, what is really the reason why we need e privacy, not only GDPR? I suppose it's clear for you dealing with these matters, but I just will repeat. It is really different. Scope. Because if we speak about personal data in terms of GDPR, we speak about structured data, which are really created as personal data. If we speak about communication content, then we can communicate about everything, about weather, about, I don't know, some technologies, um, about abstract philosophical ideas, anything. But if we talk with people we know, with group we define, not just publishing it to somebody, that it is concerned or considered to be private conversation, private communication. And it needs protection as such, in total. Not just pieces of content which are personal. The same concerns if you are using cloud service. Yeah? Then I remember when uh, we, had work, we were working on a digital contract, and then there was uh, the meeting concerning <coughs> what we mean by content there and how we need to protect there. Then even from people who were very knowledgeable professionals, oh, in cloud, if you have photos there and they're paysage photos, then they're nothing personal. You know, namely, e privacy is covering everything what you have produced put it in cloud, uh, spend it, uh, send it to your friend or to group uh, uh, as private and confidential. Not dependent on the thematics and so on. And that's a very big difference. That's a very big difference. And uh, when now you look at the old experiences we have already in this world of social media, which really didn't exist, when this directive, which is now uh, working, uh, it didn't exist this time. All these things, so Messenger didn't exist, Skype didn't exist. Though now e-privacy is covering all the 
those new ways to spread information, receive information, share information between people. And it means that it has novelties which are not really covered in the current uh, current legislation. Uh, now there is a really kind of fear that uh, this new regulation it will in some way like lock uh, developments, technological developments, because oh, we had full freedom to use your photos, to use your content, everything, to make the profiles, and we have first also in my country I saw the very nice advertising. Oh, our firm is processing all you put on the internet, uh, and we provide <coughs> banks, and we provide all providers with with very clear profiles of all your clients individually, including their sexual inclination and all the other things. Is it my God? It's the last time to pass a privacy regulation to protect citizens from this kind of abuse. You see, it is really the, the, the situation where technology is fastly going up with new discoveries, with new opportunities to process anything. Because really, datafication is becoming total. We need the, the data economy that's here. We need data used for good. We need data for private profit. We need data for uh, public service and so on. But at the same time, we have very, very bitter experiences. In Europe, in countries like ours, we were under Soviet control, communist dictatorship. In countries which have been under German uh, occupation, say, in the wartime, when there was total, say, usage, processing of personal data, and uh, collecting personal data, you know? When Soviets left Estonia, and I was working, I was Minister of Social Affairs, and I was working in the same cabinet where the previous uh, minister was working, so that we took away the wall and we, we <coughs> below the, this uh, cover, we, we found hundreds of microphones, small boxes, which were catching everything <coughs> that was talking in this you know? So, people in Europe have very, very bitter experience about situation where personal data, personal communications were not protected, but in opposite, they were used to really have control over people. Now we can say, oh, we now have a democratic society. Absolutely, we have a democratic society. But look what Russia is doing. Using democratic society's information to influence really processes. Using very fine technologies to process personal data. And that means that we have to be prepared that uh, not only for good, for, for, for profit, a very nice firm, but also for bad. But also for control, of, but also control over consumers, control over voters. Could we use these data, we just leave behind us, <coughs> even not knowing that they are data. And, and that was behind our work and our team. Our work uh, team, of, uh, which was working on e privacy, was very much Say, I was devoted to, to, to this matter. Uh, there were people from different countries of Europe with different experiences, but we were led with the same, say, very general maybe motto that we want that Europeans will be protected online, their confidentiality of the kind of protected online in the same way like we. What in democratic society, in European culture, our private life be protected offline. And that is very simple, but it is very complicated when you have to translate it all in language which is really, the, say, adaptable to this new technological <coughs> situation. And sure, <coughs> we did. We did with say, our best best knowledge. We were listening to hundreds and hundreds of voices from industries. We had people from industry coming every day. We had listening from hundreds and hundreds of voices from consumer protection organizations, uh, from universities, from health services. So we were very very open. We were very open. We took in as as much as we could not to go into controversy with our say, main principles. We tried to be more flexible than it was in commission draft. I have to say that when we received commission draft, 
uh, we found that there was something which was not as say flexible <coughs> we wanted to say. We hope that we we managed to make things a bit better. Uh, concerning, for example, things uh, with browsers uh, and some others. <coughs> Uh, and certainly also inside this group we had different, say, different levels of understanding how strict this regulation should be. Uh, and as you know, the vote uh, uh, in Parliament was in October, uh, and uh, the vote was passed in plenary, but uh, with not, say, very big margin at all. Because up to the end, we had even last last evening before the vote, <laughs> we still had some some debates going on. We we hope to have some compromises we didn't reach, really. So, uh, but that's life. That's the life in legislation. You you can pass what you can pass. You can pass where you have majority. <laughs> you can make compromises still when you keep majority. If you make compromise where nobody will be supporting, then you will not have the power. Uh, and here we are now, the parliament has made decisions, so all we discuss now cannot, cannot influence this text already approved by parliament. Commission has made proposal, we have changed it in parliament. Now there is a council, and in council every country has their uh, own representative. That means that all what could be changed now could be changed only in trial law by council. The trial law's rule is that all of those articles will be open for debate, which will be open by council. So commission or parliament will not go back and say, oh, we want to redraw something. Only council. And that means that each country now has to say where are the concerns, and then on trial law, the council, the presidency have to represent council, and then there will be commission on the table, parliament on the table, the council on the table, and through trial law, all these articles will be already put on the table where council was saying, here we don't agree. So that's a knowledge. But that means that this kind of meeting maybe could help, because I suppose the Irish voice is very important voice in all these matters concerning digital, like voice of any other member states. Thank you. Thank you very much.